speakers tell a lot about their, the, the speaker's story, and uh, I'm not going to do that this morning. Uh, thank you. I've heard, I've heard the gentleman speak before. I've heard several of this gentleman's tapes. And uh, it's my privilege and a pleasure to introduce our final speaker of the 2002 Bash, Bob E. Bob, it's my absolute pleasure to be able to present this lay from the Big Island Bash to you today. But, but, other, but unlike the previous gentleman, I have to let Bob know that many years ago when I came into this program, I had some mentors in my most troubled times trying to get sober. And this gentleman's tape started out with a broken back and got a job as a writer. And I listened to his life through his tapes and never had the pleasure of meeting him. And so it's been wonderful to hear what's happened since then. <laughs> God bless you. Good morning. I'm Bob. I'm an addict and an alcoholic. Privileged to be the second Sunday morning speaker. <laughs> I mean, we, you know, we're all self obsessed alcoholics. That's the longest introduction I ever had that had nothing <laughs> that had nothing to do with me. <laughs> Oh, well. I'm, um, I've had a good, I mean, I'm limited certainly in, 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 in everything that I've done. I uh, sort of took a pass on the golf, um, and the boats and the fishing and, um, you know, the rest of it. But I've, I had a really good time and, and I, and I love the people. The people have been very, very kind and very generous to me. And I debated whether or not to wear this shirt this morning. It's my, one of my favorite shirts, but I have a very colorful shirt that I like a lot, too. And because you've all been so kind to me, I will save you a two-excedrin headache. <laughs> the words do not go together and do not make sense on the shirt. So if you want to sit, you know, so many people try and figure all this out, and it's not figurable. So I'll tell you that now. We'll go on from there. Is anybody else of the mind that this hotel tries to make everything hard to get into? <laughs> the coffee, for instance. Some of them have little slits that you tear. Some of them don't. I am bipolar. I am properly medicated. But there are... There are things. <laughs> it was when I found myself shutting it in the door and turning the deadbolt on it and ripping at it that, <laughs> that I thought perhaps we could have a better design here, you know. And then I went to get the soap, you know, to wash my hands. I opened the box, but you, if you open it upside down, you can't see that little tie, you know, so you don't know it's in cellophane. <laughs> so... I'm scrubbing my hands thinking, this is the cheapest ass soap I've ever seen, you know, in my life. It's like. I looked at my room and was like, God, I don't know if I'm going to survive the weekend in this room. 
And bipolars love rooms, you know. <laughs> Empty ones. I got to thank my hosts, man. I, I mean, without John and Bill, <laughs> I had to say that. It's actually Chuck and Paul. Um, <laughs> But but Chuck is an orthopedic surgeon, so he understands a lot of, of, of what I've been through and some of the brain damage. And, and uh, uh, Mary Ann called me up and said, we have an orthopedic surgeon over here who heard your tape, and he really wants to be your host. Now, you know, after 39 years of sobriety, you sort of learn to read God's road signs. <laughs> I thought, well, it works for me. <laughs> you know, if my case got fall out of the car or down the stairs, I have my own surgeon, you know, right, <clears throat> right there. Uh, I have been reassembled lately. Ah, uh, God, I don't know what I want to talk about. Um, lately I've taken a run has anybody done any of that online dating stuff <laughs> sober <laughs> I will tell you when it comes to physical description the word average has taken on a meaning to me as a writer that I never considered you know, it's it's really a trip. It's it's it's. I've been divorced a while, and and so I thought, well, you know, maybe outside AA we'll look online. You know, because a, a, a relationship, two people meet. You know, it's kind of like two trash trucks colliding, <laughs> and. Uh, Well, now that's not a negative. That's that's not a negative. If if you're blessed enough to find a partner who is willing to sort through the trash with you, so you can figure out whose is whose, you might have to get a counselor in there to help. You you can you can really really build a, a meaningful, incredible relationship but just know up front <laughs> whether you like it or not your history plays a large part in your relationships I never knew how to grieve so of course I never grieved the loss of a relationship and if you can't grieve you can't close and if you can't close it means I bring them with me so I would show up at your door and knock and pick you up for the first date, but there would be 13 others standing behind me in the hall, <laughs> you know, that I hadn't dealt with yet. Where they were all going along for the ride, and we hoped you had a large bed. You know, it was like... Um, God, I, I am... I've been married seven times. Why? I mean, my thought would be, well, there's a guy that tries, man, you know. <laughs> hasn't given up, hasn't gotten bitter, you know. Keeps on plugging. Six times sober, one time drinking. One wife died two months after we were married. Probably the woman I love more than anyone in the world. But that, too, is subject to, you know, it's awfully easy to look back and say that. I don't know. I believe it. My friends who were around me at the time believe it. And um, that crushed me because I have always told people that I've sponsored, you can never, ever in your life, no matter what you've done, bring to me a problem that will 
terrify me or petrify me or turn me against you or that if I don't have the answer, I can't find you an answer to. You, however, can bring to me solutions to your problems that will scare me to death. (laughs) You know. And one of my solutions for years, the first eight anyway, to a bad relationship was she should die. I mean, it's the only thing I could think of. I'm not, wasn't confronted. I am a battered child, severely battered child. We're talking broken bones and nose and ribs and corners of the eyes tore out by my mother. So it's like I can't stand overt anger from a woman. I mean, couldn't. Now it's cool. You know, I got, I got you. <laughs> I got your number now. You're not as much fun as the ones with the covert anger, but it's okay. (laughs) I could handle women with covert anger. You know, I could spot the woman with the most covert anger in the room across a ballroom with a thousand people in it. You know, and just make the beeline and say, hi, I want to go to coffee? (laughs) You know. And I have this immense, unknown to me, hatred uh, of women. I mean, I really would like to have killed my mother. And I am a street drug smuggler with the bullet holes and knife scars and all that shit to prove it. And um, so when I say I would like to have killed my mother, it, it has maybe deeper meaning than a lot of other people. Um, but I couldn't stand... If you got loud or mad at me, the minute you got loud, your anger became visible to me inside. I was reduced to a two-year-old little boy who was about to get hurt very badly and no one was going to come help me. So my job is get you unmad, which... At the time, I was producing and writing television and and making, uh, you know, obscene money. And so usually, you know, you just give them credit cards and let them go shop. And trust me, that is not a good idea. So if if you cannot, if you're like me and uh, you have trouble with women's anger, for God's sakes, don't give them a credit card. (laughs) Lori slammed Dunk Rodeo Drive one day on an American Express gold card. <laughs> oh, God. Now nobody can shop like a woman who who's angry at the man on the card that she's angry at. <laughs> it's genetic. It's built in. <laughs> they haven't even been taught it. It's just natural. <laughs> Very pricey. So relationships were tough. I would always find these women with the covert anger. Now, the hook there is the covert anger comes out sexually so that all the busted headboards and plaster knocked out of walls with people's heads and collapsed kitchen tables and dented car hoods and carpet burns and all the rest of that stuff, we would write off as making love, (laughs) you know. When actually we were trying to kill each other, you know, just in a socially acceptable way. <laughs> took a lot of took a lot of therapy to get me through that one. Let me tell you, but I've I've had good relationships, bad ones. I think it's just part of being in this program, you know. And I think you gotta you gotta go as long as you gotta go. I mean, I would love to find. My my last love, the last great love. I'm 66 years old. God, you know, for God's sakes, I'm 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 ready to. Um, I'd love to have that in my life and share it. My therapist, unfortunately, is an asshole, and you know, <laughs> he, he says, "Well, let's make a list of what you got to offer." <laughs> Oh, well, 
to hell. I, I still love him. Okay. The cane. I am what you call a task-oriented person. Which means as long as I am busy, I have value. As long as I'm busy, I have a right to be here. As long as I complete things within a certain time frame, I have value and I have a right to be here. So that's basically, over the years, in sobriety, the only way God has been able to get me to surrender to the depths of my being is to stop me physically. I mean, literally stop me. Like she was saying about the broken back. I mean, that's, you know, I was a die caster and broke my back and through the things following that became a writer. I have a 10th grade education. They threw me out of two of the worst schools in Los Angeles and finally threw me out of the school system. I was a charming little fellow to deal with. And I couldn't spell and fail at English. And, you know, so when I went to my voc rehab counselor with this matchbook cover, you know, that I wanted to be a writer, she just, <laughs> but just she went, almost fell out of her wheelchair. She was laughing so hard. <laughs> but she took it into her boss, and I, I, had been, I had been on their rolls for six months. I was like the black mark of the Van Nuys Office of Vocational Rehabilitation. This guy would assign for basket weaving for me if if I wanted it, just to get me off the rolls, you know. And she said, well, we don't pay for correspondence courses, you know. And she went in and talked to him and came back out and said, well, it's okay. (laughs) You can send for the books and, and we'll pay. So I did one assignment and in the interim turned in one script. I won't go into that long story, filled with Eskimos and... God's road science and handiwork. But the first thing I submitted to a major studio I sold, and that was the beginning of of a, a long and a successful writing career. I am one of those who got down on my knees and thanked God when the first word processor came out. I, I had paid women so much money to retype scripts, you know, because most people don't know dead is spelled D-E-D, you know. It's a... Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> I had a rather simplistic language that worked for me, but not too well for others, you know. (laughs) So, I have recently been stopped, and I have recently had the most powerful spiritual experience at that time in 38 years of sobriety. Last year, well, year before, over Christmas and New Year's, I had my daughter with me. She was 13. And we spent like, I don't know, about three weeks together over Christmas and New Year's. And we got her a gown and we went to the big sober New Year's ball. And just, we had, man, we had a time. I mean, this is the apple of my eye. I love this child. Oh, God, I love her. And I took her home, drove her back to Palm Springs. January 3rd, and I'm coming back from Palm Springs, and I'm in a great place, man. I'm mellowed out. I mean, I've had, I've had this time with my baby. I'm, I'm just, I'm not even speeding, you know. I'm, I'm pretty lead foot, but I'm doing about 55. I'm smoking a cigar. I'm perfectly happy. And some young girl had had a flat tire in the fast lane on the interstate. And she put on her blinker lights and turned off her engine. So I come around this curb at 55 miles an hour, and there's a parked car. That was it. I mean, that was really it. There wasn't even a skid mark. I didn't even have time to hit my brakes. It took them an hour and a half to cut me out of the car. They had to get a special truck, a second truck. I do have to admit I probably wasn't the best example of AA to the paramedic that was trying to hold me up. He kept saying everything's going to be okay, and I said, who are you fucking kidding? You know, I'm... 
I'm in so much pain, I'm about to die here, and you guys can't even move me, you know, one inch one way or the other, and I don't think everything's going to be okay. God bless paramedics, man. They're my heroes now. Anyway, they finally get me out of the car, and they get me in the paramedic ambulance. Now, I'm all my ribs are broken, one of my lungs is punctured, both my knees are, are, are completely screwed up. I have reshaped the windshield with my head. There's some problems with my brain. I have fractured my left hip all the way up to and including the socket and and fractured the one and two uh, cervix vertebrae. Um, I'm, I'm not in good shape and my throat's crushed from the hitting the steering wheel. And this is out by Colton in California. And the paramedics are talking about, you know, the guy sitting next to me and the guy driving, and they're talking about which hospital to take me to. And the the, the guy sitting next to me says, well, they're, they're discussing between three. And the guy sitting next to me, who had been looking after me for a long time, God bless him, I mean, he, he sat there for an hour, squatted down with his knee up like this, keeping me level so I wouldn't, you know... Because I was half in the car, half out, so that the top half of me wouldn't f- fall to the pavement below the car. And so he finally decided Arrowhead Hospital was the hospital to take me to. Now, I can't make a sound except moan. And I, I'm listening to him say Arrowhead Hospital. And I am laying in the back, screaming at the top of my lungs. And I want you to know, not a sound is coming out. And I'm thinking, Arrowhead? I don't want to go to fucking Arrowhead. I want to hear Cedars. I want to hear UCLA, for God's sakes. I don't, I don't want to hear Arrowhead. You know, I, what do you mean Arrowhead, for Christ's sakes? <laughs> I'm a dead man, you know, if I've got Arrowhead, uh, you know. Then I went out, well, I passed out once, I came to only one more time when they were making the incision to shove the tube in to inflate the lung. <laughs> Let me tell you, that's not as charming as it looks on the medical shows on TV. <sighs> then I quietly did, I guess, what any good alcoholic w- would do, or... Or somebody that's been shot and stabbed a lot and suffered a lot of pain. I went into a three-week coma. Halfway through this three-week coma, they thought I was going to, well, they were convinced most of the time I was going to die. My ex-wife, God bless her, can be very formidable when she wants to be. And she had convinced them she still had power of attorney over my medical decisions, even though she was remarried and we were divorced. This is an incredibly beautiful artist. Artist looks like an Indian, and you don't want to, you know. <laughs> when she wants something, man, let me tell you, it's incredible. Um, and so about halfway through, my brain waves took a dump, you know, and they started looking at me in pieces, you know, like kidney, heart, lungs, liver. And were ready to uncork me from whatever I was plugged into. And and she said to them, she said, no. She said, I don't think so. She said, I think we'll wait a couple of days. He could just, if you knew him well, you would know he could just be thinking. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and the all just said, oh, okay, I mean, how the hell did he know, you know? He figured she knew me, you know, she said, you got to understand how intensely this guy thinks, you know. I mean, anxiety has been my drug of choice throughout recovery. Well, I love it. I, you know, I don't need anybody else to, you know, to to get it to complete it. All I got to do is go home, sit down in a chair, start thinking, and I can have myself in a complete panic attack within three minutes, you know. 
send me to the mailbox, put in an envelope from the IRS, and I'm done. You know, I mean, I won't open it for three days. You know, I'll carry it around on my forehead like Karnak, you know, trying to read through the thing, knowing I'm going to the federal penitentiary. And it, it'll probably be at the end when I finally open it, a check for $3.65, you know. So, so I have put myself through all this torture for, for three days for $3.65. You would think I'd get the message, but that seems to elude me. Um, so anyway, finally I came out of the coma. I would like to, to... There was one point in the coma where... I mean, it's very interesting. It's kind of like, for any of you who miss, mixed peyote and, and mescaline and, and, and morphine, it's, 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 it's very mellow. It's, it's not, or mine was. It was not ni- nightmarish, but it was constant dreams, just like without stopping. And the only thing I wanted was a Diet Coke and a cigar, you know, in this thing. And at one point, I'm laying in this very clean dirt. And it won't stick to your body or your clothes or your shirt. And it's a quiet place. And a voice says, this could be it. It could be over. And I thought for a second, it wasn't too long, just kind of my life just sort of went spinning by. And I said, and I even amazed myself when I said this. I said, you know what? It's okay. I'm 65. I've had a great life, man. I've had a great life. And if i got to go now, it's all right. I would love to know if that's the moment I came out of the coma. I mean, I don't know. I have no idea. You know, I came out of the coma. I'm a television writer. My opening line was, change the channel. That's a fucking terrible show. <laughs> <clears throat> the coma was a gift because I was really a mess and, and the pain after those surgeries that I had had and having a bar between my legs and ski boots on my feet and because they were just terrified of this one and two cervix vertebrae, I was in a some kind of fiberglass collar. You can hardly breathe, but you cannot move. I mean, you absolutely, absolutely cannot move. So I missed that three weeks of fun. And so I've always seen that as a gift, that I didn't have to go through that. Well, then they moved me to a second hospital. I hated this hospital. I hated everybody in this hospital. They had, I mean, I'm telling you, you know, my diaper would get dirty and they would come in and take it off and put on another and they wouldn't clean me up. And I had one nurse who, after I would buzz for my pain medication, and my pain was was severe. I have a very, very high tolerance for pain. Unfortunately, I also have very high tolerance for pain medication, you know. <laughs> it takes a while before you get that worked out with, uh, you know, MD. And, um, I mean, I just, it was just, oh, God. I mean, she would make me wait an hour, and I'm talking tears in the eyes kind of, of pain in the body that just, you know, and I got mad. And, and I am, if you can't tell, you know, I am bipolar and, and, and I can be anger to the point of homicide from the streets so when I get mad I get mad and I learned to drag my ass out of that bed into a wheelchair when it was time for pain medication and I would roll myself out to the nurse's station and you know going now you know and I would get my pain medication I'd roll myself back and I'd drag myself back into bed what I didn't realize at the time was I had started moving. And I got to tell you, I think it would have been very easy for me just to lay there. 
and not get up and not do physical therapy and not get put in a wheelchair. And and because my friends who saw me come into the second hospital said, I still look like I was dying when I arrived. And uh, when I arrived at the second hospital, just to show you that, that I have never changed, the, the, after the ambulance transportation from Colton all the way into Encino, um, <laughs> the pain was just, just beyond belief. And, and they rolled me up to the nurse's station and she just took a big needle of morphine and hit me right in the neck with it, you know. And my first thought was, why the hell didn't I ever think of that? <laughs> you know? I spent so much time sitting around waiting for stuff to work, you know? And that was instant, let me tell you, man. That was like, that was like immediate, you know, goodbye. So I spent a month and a half in this hospital, angry, hating my physical therapist, hating the nurses. They had to tie me to the bed because I kept pulling the feeding tube out of my nose. And I was too, my brain, they were doing CRTs every day because of the condition of my brain. So they couldn't, they couldn't knock me out to put a, a stomach feeding hole in my in my stomach and get rid of the nose tube and I mean just all this stuff you know and they're, and they're, and they're like saying well we're going to have to put a shunt in your brain and you know and I'm like and, and they said well then it will wear out and we'll have to change it and I'm like I'm just not too happy and and they bring in this uh, this Asian um, neurologist from neurosurgeon from UCLA as a final consultant and he looks at me and he looks at the x-rays and he said well so far the fluid in your head is contained. There is enough, there is enough space for the amount of fluid. He said, now, if you produce more, you could die. And the thing we're worried about is that you have a, a, a right eye that's partially, you know, it's not as big as the left eye. And that could be the indication that there's more fluid coming and that we need to get a shunt in. And he said, but there's also a chance this, your eye could have been like that forever. So can you get me any photographs? I don't know, you know, a surgeon who doesn't want to perform surgery, do you love this? So I sent a friend to my house and he got like 20 photographs and then everyone, and my, you know, I got to have my right eye like, like down, so they didn't have to do the surgery and put the shunts in my brain, for which I am eternally grateful. <laughs> Finally, I got the feeding tube out of my nose. That was, oh, thank God. And then um, they come into me after about a month and a half, and they say, we're moving you to another hospital. I went nuts. Completely nuts. You have to remember, I have a manic side that that can go off the chart. And I went off all their charts. You know, their little smiling faces. You know, are you an 8 or a 9 or breathing or, you know. I mean, I was a 37. And they gave me a couple of, I don't know, some kind of tranquilizers. Didn't work. Not even dented the panic attack. Gave me a couple of more, you know, stronger ones. Didn't work. Didn't even dent the panic attack. Finally, they came in and gave me a, three cc's of Xanax in, a, in an injection. I mean, they were going to do anything to shut me up. But I didn't want to go. Can you believe that? Well, yes, of course you can. You're alcoholics. <laughs> as bad as I hated that hospital, I didn't want to go to another one. I didn't want to meet new nurses. I just didn't want a different bed. I didn't want different hallways. I didn't want different anything. As bad as this was, man, it was familiar, you know, which is certainly a problem for many of us, the staying stuck in the familiar. You know, where they, what, what's the old joke about, you know, you show us a rut and we'll furnish it? So the social worker comes in my room and says to me, the liaison nurse from Casa Colina is going to be here tomorrow. 
She's going to go over all your records, and then she's going to interview you and get you prepared to move. And she said, oh, she she started out the door, and she said, oh, by the way, she said to tell you she knows you from the program. That's it. I'm completely relaxed. You know, I mean, I know road signs when I see them, for God's sakes. You know, I'm like just laying there, mellow. I mean, they can't figure out what happened because I went from nuts off the chart to, well, all right. (laughs) What time is she going to be here? You know, it's like. I, they knew I was bipolar and, 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 and on medications for it. <coughs> so they come and they move me to this other hospital. And they get me in this room with three physical therapists and the head of physical therapy. These are the three that are going to be my physical therapists because we're still looking at a wheelchair for life. And my, um, this is the first time anybody ever asked me anything. God, I love this hospital. And the head of physical therapy looked at me and said, what would you like to accomplish while you're here? It's the first question anybody asked me. I said, I'd like to leave on a cane. I really, really would like to leave on a cane. And he said, okay, if you will work with these three people, and it's going to be hard, I guarantee you'll leave on a cane. And I thought, wow, I mean, what a goddamn miracle, right? So I start working with them, and I mean, it was just murders, but it was okay. It was okay. And and they had a beautiful courtyard in this hospital. Um, flowers and trees and a big fountain and just absolutely gorgeous. Now... At that point, for 38 years of sobriety, my spiritual program had never been enough. If you ask me, my critic, I had never meditated long enough. I had never prayed the right prayers. When driving up the Pacific Coast Highway, I would see the ocean and take a little glance at it and smile. And then I would just beat the shit out of myself for not having stopped the car, sat on the fender, and spent a half hour to drink in the beauty of God's glory and all that. I mean, whatever I did was never enough. I used to get up at 8 o'clock in the morning and meditate. for I mean, 4 o'clock in the morning and meditate until 8, you know. And then go out and try and kill somebody on the freeway. It was... It was um, <laughs> It was, it just was never enough. I mean, the miracles were in my life, but I wasn't enough. I wasn't enough and my spiritual program wasn't enough. Which meant to me that, that my rest of my life was going to be a struggle. No matter what. I was going to have good times and up times, but it was going to be a struggle. And one afternoon I'm sitting in this courtyard in my wheelchair with my can of Diet Coke and a cigar and a book. And I realized that from the time of the accident had happened until that moment, I had said one prayer for maybe ten seconds, if that. And I had meditated for five seconds, maybe once. That was the full extent of my spiritual outlay in all that time in the condition I was in. And I realized I was alive and I was supposed to be dead. I was going to leave on a cane and I was supposed to be in a wheelchair. And I got it. It was God's grace. And that the highest form of spirituality is Popeye's. I am what I am. You know? For those of you that didn't hear Margaret yesterday, man, buy the tape, particularly the women, because she was a brilliant, beautiful example of I am what I am. And that was like 38 years sober, and I got it. I got it. I'm okay. In God's eyes, 
I might not be in yours, or I might wear not wear the right shirt, or I'm very unhappy with. I'm working my ass off with physical therapy now. We're back in it, and uh, but they don't have any ab machines for me, and I'm very unhappy with my stomach. You know, physical. Of course, I live in Southern California for Christ's sakes. I got to I got to get out of there before I shoot myself. <laughs> When my wife got pregnant with Tina, we moved to New, we, we were living in New Mexico in Santa Fe, and she said, I'm so glad I'm here. She said, I hate to have to walk by Matrix, you know, with all these perfect bodies coming out with this belly, you know. And, and where in New Mexico it was opposite. Men would come up on the street and grin and pat her stomach and, you know, just tell her how wonderful it was that she was, that she was pregnant. What am I trying to say? What do I have time to say? (laughs) A little bit here, I guess. I don't know what time this is supposed to end. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. (laughs) Oh, don't get me started, man. I can go back to the great 50th anniversary meeting of the AA in Seattle where they had this big birthday party and, and I was one of the speakers and all the speakers are going before me, Dr. Paul and a few of the others, you know, traditional, buy the book, down the goddamn line. And I finally took the guy aside. I said, are you, I, I, who asked me? You know, <laughs> are, are, are you sure you want me here for this 50th AA birthday you know, celebration, because I don't think we're doing as great as, as they think we are. You know, uh, our recovery rate is 8%, and so is treatment. <laughs> you know, so, uh, I mean, there's a few things I, I think that are wrong. Like, we throw people away with a very simple line. They stop going to meetings. I mean, that's, the, that's the tragic that we say that about people. You know, the, the question should be, what is it that we're not providing that this person needs? I mean, they might need a therapist. They might be clinically depressed. And if you've never been clinically depressed, I don't expect you to understand it. I really don't. I mean, I can always tell in two seconds whether I really want to talk to somebody about depression. If I walk in a room and somebody says, how are you? And I say, oh, God, I'm really depressed today. And they say, what about it? I say, God, I'll just see you later. You know. There is no cause. So, there's a lot of people, I think, like me, who need some extra um, uh, help. And there is a lot of flack in AA about therapy. It used to be therapy. Now we've got medications to focus on and all kinds of crap. I want to tell you that if you're, if you're going to tell someone you sponsor to stop taking their medications, you should at least have minimum malpractice insurance. <laughs> Otherwise, shut up. I'm very serious about this. You know. But we have, of course, the people who live, die, and beat you to death with the first 164 pages of the big book. That's it. That's all you need. That's all you'll ever need. That'll take care of absolutely everything in your life. <laughs> well, if you read it, it will, but, you know, it's... But this... Well, I'll read the whole thing. Now about health. Something you rarely hear talked about at a meeting. Like feelings. A body badly burned by alcohol does not often recover overnight, nor do twisted thinking and depression vanish in a twinkling. We are convinced that a spiritual mode of living is a most powerful health restorative. We who have recovered from serious drinking are miracles of mental health. Amen. (laughs) 
But we have seen remarkable transformations in our bodies. Hardly one of our crowd now shows any mark of dissipation. But this does not mean that we disregard human health measures. This is a very clear, unclear, murky paragraph here. God has abundantly supplied this world with fine doctors, psychologists, and practitioners of various kinds. I don't want to touch practitioners of various kinds. Bill, uh, I mean, these are two guys that used to use the Ouija board after the meeting, for Christ's sakes. <laughs> Bill was a good friend of Arthur Ford, the psychic before Arthur got sober. Uh, he saved his, once life, his life once on a spiritual message Bill got and went to his apartment. And he was laying on the floor. He'd had a heart attack. So I have no idea what he meant by, spirit, <laughs> by practitioners of various kinds. I can only guess. Do not hesitate. It's a powerful line. Do not hesitate. Where do I go here? Do not hesitate to take your health problems to such persons. Most of them give freely of themselves that their fellows may enjoy sound minds and bodies. Try to remember that though God has wrought miracles among us, we should never, boy, that's unclear, we should never (laughs) belittle a good doctor or psychiatrist. Their services are often indispensable in treating a newcomer and following his case afterwards. And then on the next page, it goes on to say about sex relations. Alcohol is so sexually stimulating to some men that they have overindulged. I have no idea who the hell wrote that line, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> what me? <laughs> you know, alcohol is like walking out into a cold ocean. <laughs> You have to just look for it. <laughs> oh, that's just true. Sometimes I just can't help myself. Couples are occasionally dismayed to find that when drinking is stopped, the man tends to be impotent. Unless the reason is understood, there may be an emotional upset. Some of us have had this experience only to enjoy in a few months of finer intimacy than ever. There should be no hesitancy. Again, very unclear. There should be no hesitancy in consulting a doctor or psychologist if the condition persists. We do not know of many cases where this difficulty lasted long. Now, this is page 132 and 4, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, contained within the first sacred 164 pages of Alcoholics Anonymous. And what they're saying, basically, is there's some of us that need a little more help than others. It doesn't mean we're worse or weak or less or, you know, I was 17 years sober and all I could think about is laying down in a gutter with cold, clean water running through it and dying. The thought of suicide, of actually taking my life, would have been a step up in the depression. That started therapy. Therapy started feelings. Feelings started an entire new life. I had to grieve my wife that had died seven years after she died. I got to grieve. It was the just. I spent three days locked in my condo in the corner on the floor, curled up, sobbing and bawling and crying because someone I loved was gone. And more importantly, someone who genuinely loved me was gone. I learned about grief. I had to learn about feelings. I was so shut off, I had to learn. And I don't like them. You know, and then, of course, I had to find out that mine are extreme, (laughs) both ends. And and when I was 33 years sober, I went to UCLA to see why I was so completely screwed up. I thought I was uh, 
had attention deficit disorder. And by the time I got out of there after a battery of tests, I found out I was bipolar and been going through that mess after that. I think the first thing I would like to tell people is that if you're not aware of any of this, the medications that are given for for my kind of condition are not like you think of medication when you think of medication. It's not like you take three packs in the morning and then get really high and go ride your bicycle 100 miles an hour, you know. <clears throat> there's no effect. I mean, there's absolutely no effect. You feel no effect. I mean, I would not recommend Xanax or Valium or any of those as ongoing, continuing therapeutic drugs for someone bipolar, but um, there's just nothing except you feel a little better. You feel a little better. And that's it. And I can tell you, my, I got a dear friend here of 20 some odd years and his wife, and he has watched me go like, you know, a rocket ship through sobriety. Um, and a lot of it was just the intensity and the manic side of, of the, of the disease. And I really didn't do anything about it till I hit the depression. How depressed can you get, Bob? I can get so depressed that I do not leave my house for a week, I do not shower for a week, I do not shave for a week, and I sit in the same spot on the same couch and do not move for a week, except if I have to go to the bathroom and do not eat. That's it. I can't do it. I cannot get out of the house. I cannot get off the house. I mean off the couch. I cannot move. That's clinical depression. It's not my girlfriend left me and I feel like shit. You know, that's not a reason to begin a long, drawn out, you know, drug rehab. It's that you can't move. You can't move. Well, hell, I get up every day now. Most days I feel really pretty good. And uh, my life's okay. And like I said, the only thing is missing is her. Of course, whenever I've been single, that's always been the problem. She's always been missing. You know, I've in my early sobriety, I used to cruise the streets at four in the morning looking for her. You know, she was she was going to be tall and blonde and leaning against the fender of her Rolls Royce. You know, and I uh, I can't believe I just can't believe that oh god the stuff I used to do. Sex addiction is a great way to run from your from your feelings. Task orientation. Let me explain task orientation and shut up. Task orientation is like I'm home. I go out in the kitchen. I open the refrigerator and I look at there's no milk. I close the refrigerator door and I think I need to go to the market and get some milk. Now, so far, this is a prime example of mental health. I, I have identified a problem and, and I have... And I have come up with a solution for the problem. Now, here's where we get in trouble. I look at my watch and decide I need to be back home by 3.30. Now, I have nowhere to go till 6. Right? But if I'm going to have value, I am going to pull this milk errand off by 3.30. Now, what does this set me up for? Red lights. Blue-haired old ladies driving the car in front of me, getting into the parking lot, getting in the 12 items or less no checks line behind some lady with 20 goddamn items in her checkbook, <laughs> who I'm standing with perspiration pouring off of me thinking I'm going to kill her. When she's in the parking lot, I'm going to run her down with my car. I am completely insane. I finally get out of the store. I get home. It's like 3.35, and I've blown it. But that's task orientation. As long as you got something to do, you have value. Very big one among women. Men at work, women at home. As long as I'm doing something, I have value. To just go out to the local park and lay down on the grass and look at the sky, doing nothing, and know at that, and breathing, hopefully. And, and know at that moment you are as valuable to God and as loved by God 
as you could be if you were pulling people out of the Twin Towers. That grace has no rules. If it did, I would not be standing here today. And the cane is probably going to go by the end of the year. If I can hold up this. Oh, God, yes, I'm glad I said that. So after all my yelling and screaming and, and whining about Arrowhead, and then, of course, I go into the coma and all that, and then I get out, and then I'm in the other hospitals, and the other orthopedic surgeons are looking at x-rays, and I call in an expert from UCLA and an expert from Cedars, orthopedic surgeons. Every surgeon who looked at the x-rays said, this guy who put your hip back together was an absolute genius. I was supposed to be in Arrowhead Hospital. He was a young doctor with young ideas, a young surgeon. And these orthopedic surgeons are not big on complimenting each other. They tend to be a little... (laughs) Prima Donna, sorry, Chuck, but you know it's true. (laughs) You know it's true. (laughs) So I was in the hospital I was supposed to be in. And the second hospital where I was so angry, what tool did God have to use to get me out of bed and get me moving so I would live? Anger. Anger. Get me mad. And I will show you. You will not treat me like this. You know, they even tied me to the bed one night. And I told him, I said, man, you can't do this. I'm a human being, not an animal. You know, because I kept pulling this tube out. I don't even want to tell you about the horror of it going back down. (laughs) But I was supposed to be in that hospital. And then the third hospital, where they listened to me. And they had the courtyard. And I could sit quietly. And I could learn that regardless of what I've told myself over 39 years of sobriety, about my spiritual program, it's enough. And not only is it enough, I'm enough. As is. There is no way on God's earth I could be any different this second based on the experiences that have transpired in my life than I am. No way. You know, you just, this is it. Well, now there may be some changes I want to, things I want to change. Okay. But the reality is, I am what I am. You know, it's like dealing with women, you know, when you're dating and all that stuff and they say, oh God, I don't know, you know, I had quite a few past lovers and, 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 and I say, well, you know, if, if, as, as, as good a lover as you are, if you'll give me their address, I'll send them thank you cards, you know, (laughs) because it's, as far as I'm concerned, they have contributed to, to uh, you know, this moment. <laughs> I'm, I'm the end result of everything that has transpired. I am a love child by a love God, obviously, by grace. The most important word in my vocabulary today. So if you leave here with nothing other than you are what you are, and that's just fine. May not be what you want to be, but it's okay. You couldn't be any different. You could not be any different this minute based on the experiences you've had. Till this second. That's why I love the guy who said he takes his tape home. You know, the sponsor listens to it. That's the next day. That's the most ludicrous thing I ever heard of. I mean, I'm a speaker. Jesus, I can change my mind on the way home. You know, so, so, you know, people get crazy over a talk I give. You know, they're up pacing the house at 3 o'clock in the morning. And I've already, you know, been driving home thinking, God, I don't know if I really believe that. You know. So... It's, it's like moment to moment. 
I have had, this is my first long trip, and, and it, has, it has taken a toll, and, and, and yes, I am in a lot of pain, and I gave serious consideration to, to taking the pain medication this morning, and then I thought, what a really good talk I could give on pain medication. <laughs> <laughs> So I decided I'd wait, and, and and I have had, this has been so, I don't know what the talk has done for anybody in the room, but I must tell you, this is, Mar- and Marianne, thank you. I was getting her, I was giving her a terrible time, telling her to get together a group of resumes, you know, for me to go through when I got here, you know, 50 beautiful self-supporting through their own contributions, you know. <laughs> <laughs> ah, shit. Well, you know, <laughs> they're still working on getting the medication balance. <laughs> but I want you to know, this has been so good for me. So good for me. And you people have, everybody's been kind and stepped aside or asked if they could help or, you know. It has just been really, really special for me, and I, and I want to thank you for it. And you know, I am who I am. God bless you. God bless you.